but it's very clear that consumers are running out of money. They're increasingly stressed by inflation and the exhaustion of their pandemic era, era savings. Welcome back to Real Estate Mindset. Today's video is gonna be absolutely bonkers. Now, the data is in and Walmart issues a dire economic warning suggesting that consumers are maxed out and broke and the holiday seasons are gonna show economic collapse. Christmas is not going to save retail. Now, in addition to that story and video, Mitch and I are also going to go under the hood and talk about the SBA and whether or not they're really broke. And we're also going to warn you guys, be careful getting those loans because you can never bankrupt on those loans. An SBA loan, even though it's needed for emergencies, those loans never go away. They will follow you into the grave. So if you're not careful, you will be trapped. So we're going to go over that before I continue. Mitch, Happy Monday, sir. How are you? Good. We've been at this really since late Friday, hammering on several issues that we've been working on since the beginning. And one of the interesting things we're going to attempt to do here again is to connect the dots and how, why at your hearing at Target, the consumer is maxed out. But what does that really mean? Right. It means that the economy is not good. Obviously, consumers are and mom and pop, mom and pop and consumers are the economic engine or driving force of our economy. That's not going well. Uh, and to your point, you guys, we've been working again. I feel like I've been working for 72 hours without a break at all. We have finally finished shooting the property tax course. We're offering it to you guys for free. That has been completed. I have finished writing out our masterpiece video. Mitch and I are doing one video. Everything that we've learned and try to teach you guys over the last two months is going to be in one video. We're going to have interviews from attorneys. We're going to have lawsuits. We're going to have all kinds of stuff, the bonds, everything that has been going on behind the scenes that you guys don't know about. That video is almost done. But let's get started. This came out on Saturday, October 19th. Consumers running out of money. Former Target executive offers dire warning ahead of Christmas. U.S. corporate media outlets continue to push propaganda that the economy thrives ahead of the presidential election, cheerleading the most recent retail sales print. However, most Americans know MSN is full of malarkey because inflation and interest rates force many to spend more. And here's the key, but receive less. That's why you got to look at the math. You got to go under the hood. Many folks have depleted their personal savings and racked up insurmountable credit card debt just to keep up with rising food, energy, insurance, and shelter costs. So no reckless spending, although it's happening, but this isn't mentioning it. This toxic mix of inflation sparked by failed, and I'm just going to say economics, I don't want to get political, has hit low and middle income families the hardest, potentially leading to a breaking point this upcoming holiday shopping season. Now, real quick, when it says propaganda that the media is saying the economy is thriving, I just want to point out that he has a point. If we measure the economy by how much help or support or training wills that is needed from the government, then it is not doing good. Then we're in an awful, terrible year right now with a government deficit sitting at 1.83 for 2024. That is the worst since the lockdowns. Absolutely insane. Let's listen to the video of the CEO and listen to exactly what he said. To spend whatever they have, but it's very clear that consumers are running out of money. They're increasingly stressed by inflation and the exhaustion of their pandemic era, era savings. When you take a look over the last several years, what you see month after month, everyone talks about, oh, the consumer is still spending. They might be, but they're spending less than the growth of inflation. So, for example, they're spending inflated dollars to get less. So last month, you know, the CPI was 2.5 percent. Retail sales increased 2.1 percent. So they spent more, got less, and everyone writes these stories about how they continue fueling the economy. Can you explain to the viewers how important consumer spending for mom and pop is to the economy? Well, the United States is the world's largest consumer economy. So it's not just what's important to the United States, but in reality, what's important to the globe. So even though you want to buy things that are cheaper and less expensive, there's reasons why that has occurred and should not have occurred, but you're starting to see the wheels come off because it all ends up in the lack of money in the pocket of mom and pop. And that definition really is every single real estate property owner in the United States. So what you're having occur 
is your real estate taxes are up and we've discussed some of those. We'll do that in a minute, but real estate taxes are up. Food is up. Fuel is up. Insurance costs are up. Uh, U.S. debt, national debt, the deficit up. Inflation up. When you pr create a deficit, which is what they've done of roughly one and a half trillion, that's the definition of inflation. So that's on the federal side. On the local side, through your taxing entities, your tax is up. The net result of all of these elements is that the money in your pocket is down and or negative because money is owed on the federal debt and money is owed on the taxing entity side of your local community, i.e. your school districts. That is why mom and pop doesn't have any money. What the guy at Target is saying is, okay, fine, your Target is, is going to be weak at Christmas. Yeah, that doesn't touch 90% of what I just said. Right. He's looking at it from the standpoint of sales, not from the standpoint of what the problem is. And what the problem is, is clearly the debt and the deficits is created as a direct result of both the local taxing entity as well as the federal government. Yes. And let's see from those effects, what has that caused on consumers? So in other words, let's look at the health of the consumers. Starting with consumer credit card debt, which updated October 18th, we're now sitting at 1.0 trillion. But really what I want to point out, Mitch, is right here, which is about April of 2021. So in April of 2021, as far as consumer credit card debt, which is horrible, pretty much the worst legal debt to get in, almost the worst legal debt to get in. We had a balance of 735 billion. So in less than four years, this goes up 46% in less than four years. So in less than four years, 46% or rather $340 billion more charged on credit cards. Now, the question is, is are people making their payments on this debt? This shows us, yes, obviously some people are, but the trajectory of delinquency rate on credit card loans is parabolic. It's not quite parabolic, but it is definitely skyrocketing, sitting at three and a quarter. This is a 10-year chart. The credit card delinquencies is shocking the financial system because over the last decade, they have been ridiculously low. So the fact that it's at 3.25 and still going up, is alarming. Let me max this out as well. So the last time credit card delinquencies went up, they went right up into the great financial crisis. People are like, Travis, but mortgages are okay. Homeowners are okay. And I understand the golden handcuff effect. I understand some people have equity and low interest rates. I understand all that. But do you guys understand how bad property taxes are? Do you understand how bad homeowners insurance are? Do you understand how bad apathy is and reckless consumer spending habits? And do you understand how homeowners that are in this golden handcuff effect will continuously be incentivized to sell out of their low rates to cash in on their equity. My point is, when we look at Black Knight's data, this shows the number of properties that are 30 days or more past due or in foreclosure are 1.98 million. So a lot of people, Mitch, are celebrating, having conventions, saying how great things are. But here's what's also interesting. When we look at this report, which is not Black Knight, by the way, this is an actual survey. So this is the August U.S. Census Bureau Household Pulse Survey. When they survey households and they ask households, are you currently caught up on mortgage payments? OK, so this says mortgage payments, 6.6 .6 million. So Black Knight saying 1.98. This is saying 6.6. .6. That's a 230% increase. Let's listen to one more part of this video, and then I have some questions for you, Mitch. Inflation price is still up 20% in the last three and a half years. Well, it's very clear. They just don't have the money. And when they do, do have it, they spend it on necessities first. Uh, we see that this started with lower income cohorts. When you look at people who aren't, aren't quite doing as well. They've struggled, and you see even dollars to are struggling, for gosh sakes. You know, Walmart's been the king of the hill during this period. Now the latest reports have the luxury players don't look very good either, not just in China, where of course they're off, but also in the U.S., where they're struggling to sell those handbags at the price increases they put in. So across the board now, I would expect a more muted holiday season than uh, what we what uh, some people might be talking about. Mitch, do you think that this holiday season may really be a recession wake-up call for America? We are in a recession. Um, we have been for the last 50 days explaining how bad the situation is going to be. And just in everybody's mind, just to paint a picture, no pun intended, but consider a hurricane 
and that hurricane in the center starts growing and it gets bigger and it gets wider and it starts spinning off tornadoes. Well, that's a pretty good allegory as to what's happening. And you've got a compound cumulative circular argument created by two levels of the government, be it the federal level in the form of debt and be it the local taxing entities in the form of debt that they've created through the bonds, neither one of which are gonna get paid off. So the credit card that you show the exponential growth of the defaults, well, that shows you that people are living on credit card debt. They don't understand exactly how it got to that point, but if you go back just two and a half years ago, when interest rates were at give or take two and a half percent, right now today, my cost of capital, eight and a half, nine, nine and a quarter. Well, that's up 300%. And that's why that list of items that we just went through with regard to the taxes, the food, the fuel, all of these things go up as a direct result of the inflation, which is a direct result of printing of money and or a direct result of bonds being produced that can't be paid off. So everybody says, give me more money, give me more money, give me more money. And it ends up in the form of people having to live off of credit cards. And that is how you connect the dots. Yeah, people are getting broke from taxes and from inflation, which is basically government cost of spending. Inflation yeah, it is a tax. Straight up. I mean, and it's systemic, man. I mean, they, it's a, it's an everything tax. It's very sneaky. This is the first time in my life that I've experienced such wild inflation stickiness. It's really an evil thing. But let me ask you with all of this that's going on, you know, for the people that are paying attention, may, you know, some people have money saved still. Some people are doing okay. I'm trying to, I'm fighting like crazy myself. How does the normal person hedge against all this. So if I put myself in their shoes, what about their pensions? What about their 401ks? Are we at a point and answer as best you can, but are we at a point where we should potentially withdraw our money, reinvest it? How do we hedge against the economy that we're in? Okay. So we're not here to give people financial advice. However, with that said, um, having three months of cash on hand for an emergency is absolutely critical. If you have a little bit of money in the bank and it totals up to roughly three months, um, on one hand, you could say, yeah, I've got FDIC insurance. On the other hand, given the problems in the banks, you may not have a bank that is there. Best to have cash in hand, no matter what, in case of an emergency. With regard to the idea of people saying, well, are my 401ks at risk? Are my pensions at risk? Yes. And hell yes. And the reason why is because when they take that money and they invest it in Municipal bonds, not so bad. School bonds, yeah, that's bad. There is no money to pay it back. We have yet to see a single school entity since we've been doing this research that isn't bankrupt. All they are doing is holding their hand out, give me more money, give me more money, and you can't get a legitimate balance sheet with notes attached, and you can't get a bond schedule with notes that go back and tie to the balance sheet. And none of this ties to a demand schedule that says, well, here's what we're gonna do with the upcoming bond. They just say, give me, give me. There's a huge problem there. Anybody who's put their money in a 401k that's invested in those bonds, yep, you're straight, you're at risk. And we're using that type of language to make the point right at you. You have to wake up and then Travis, to your question, what do you do about it? First off, three months cash in hand, put it in a wall, put it wherever you wanna put it, get it out of the bank. If you're in a small bank, there was a bank that just went down on Friday. Yeah. These are real problems. Yeah, the FDIC is going to cover off a certain amount, but you get 20, 30 banks that go under, the FDIC doesn't have the money. So now the government's come up with the idea, well, we're going to have a bail-in program, which basically means they're going to take your money and swap your money for shares in a bankrupt bank. It is complete insanity. It's stupid. Nonetheless, that's the law they put into place about 15 months ago. So with that said, your money is even at risk of being converted into useless shares of a bankrupt bank. Other thing is stay away. If you're in a position, stay away from the banks. Do not borrow, right? Regardless of what the interest rate is, if you can do it on your own pocketbook, you're better off in a business, a small mom and pop business. Stay small mom and pop and stay away from the banks. You have to understand just because you think you've got a good loan if that bank goes under, your loan is tainted. 
your loan very well may be called. So the banks are a problem. The SBA is a problem. Yes. Because as Travis alluded to in the very beginning of this, the SBA in and of itself, you can't discharge the debt. So if you have Social Security and you're fortunate enough to A, live long enough, B, um, have a problem in your business and that business goes down, you can't get rid of the debts in the form of a bankruptcy. You're right. stuck with that because they will withdraw your Social Security from your Social Security payment. I didn't know that. What Mitch just said, you guys, and, and we'll move on to the SBA uh, right now. And, and the reason just the backstory on the SBA, why we're covering it is, is obviously there was, man, there was hundreds of thousands, millions of people impacted by Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton. SBA has about 12,000 applications right now. They said they're not going to give any money to anyone until Congress acts. And I step back and I'm like, man, this is just, this is such a show because what they're not saying is, is that stuff, like what Mitch just said, is a loan and it's like a school loan. It will never go away. It's actually worse than a school loan because at least with school loans, you can defer payments. SBA, you can't, you can't bankrupt it. And they could, and like, Mitch, the crazy thing is like nothing can take your social security out, right? But actually, yes, this can. I mean, that's how strong these SBA loans are. So if you were impacted by the hurricane, you know, and you've already lost your business, it may be tempting to get 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars. But if your business is gone, you may, you know, you may not want to get that loan because it may end up being a trap. Let's go into a brief article. This came out a couple days ago. SBA fund is out of money after Hurricane Helene and Milton, Biden says. It's just it's just so political. It drives me absolutely crazy, Mitch. The Small Business Administration Disaster Loan Program, which provides low interest lending. So this is not, <laughs> this isn't a grant. This isn't free money. This is a loan for disaster survivors. Now they're saying this has ran out. President Joe Biden said Tuesday, it's slowing recovery options for millions of hurricane victims. And when they say that, Mitch, I'm like, what are you guys talking about? What do you mean slowing recovery? So getting a loan from the government is part of the recovery? What about the government showing up? What about the government helping because they've already paid their dues in the form of taxes? I don't know. Biden encouraged disaster survivors to continue applying for assistance and said the SBA would process new lending applications while the fund is empty and issue loans later. That's crazy. Congress is on a one month long recess. Who gets a one month vacation? Who? These guys are taking backdoor meetings. Nancy Pelosi is filthy rich from all these stocks that she's invested. Her husband got, didn't he plead guilty for insider trading? And they get to take a month off? Mitch, I haven't had a day off in months. Anyways, after next month elections and officials have said they will not call lawmakers back to Washington early to provide additional money. You, the Small Business Administration Disaster Loan Program, which is a critical lifeline, is it? If it's a critical lifeline, then why are you on vacation? White House officials have previously said the SBA needed $1.6 billion for the disaster program to get through the rest of 2025 fiscal year. And I wanted to highlight this real quick so you guys know, again, you know, this may be good for some people. The SBA issues loans worth as much as $100,000 for renters, $500,000 for homeowners, and $2 million for business owners. I've n I don't know how that would work when it's saying renters and homeowners. I, I think that must mean self-employed, Mitch. I, I don't know exactly. And typically offers much lower interest rates than commercial lenders. Now, the interest rates on these loans are from 4 to 3.25%. So they are much lower than normal. People generally don't get an SBA loan in, unless there's a catastrophe. A lot of people that lost their businesses, those businesses are gone and swept away. They'll probably, sadly, never come back. Can the SBA loans in reality, be a trap? Well, the SBA loans generally are a trap. What people don't understand is that you're borrowing from the government. So you go to a bank and the bank says, well, we have an SBA program, but nobody ever thinks about following the money. Well, where does the bank get that money? Well, they get it through the SBA loan process, okay? So the bank gets a fee, the bank has no exposure whatsoever, right? Because it's government money. So the government is acting as a bank and using other banks to where allow those banks to get a fee. Well, that's the fly trap, right? Now people are stuck on the fly trap. They're stuck on the fly paper. So once they're in that process, well, now the government knows everything about you. They're tracking you. They know everything about the business you, you have. And if you know how to handle debt, because it is relatively inexpensive debt, 
and on an interest basis, that's fine. But if that business doesn't make it, and a lot of businesses don't make it, the flip side of the coin is, yeah, you got low interest rates, flip side of the coin being, oh, crap, I now have a loan that will follow me to Social Security. So if something goes wrong, they will take your Social Security payments. They'll walk it down. Well, compound cumulative effect of interest, let's say we're in today's world, 2024, you wrote this out for 10 years, you had a problem. Well, for the next 20 or 30 years, you know, assuming you're 40 years of age, give or take, well, that compound cumulative effect of that low rate of interest, you've now paid four, five, six times of the principal plus the interest than the initial payment. The amortization is working against you. Now, if you're fortunate and you've got a good business and you're able to pay it off, hallelujah. But the bottom line is these debts on a government level will follow you. So you have to understand what it is you're getting into. Follow the money. Look at the amortization schedule. Mitch, I can't help but feel like these people treat us like a herd of animals. When part of that herd gets taken out, they're like, oh, oh well, we got all these other millions of people over here. Yeah. They need to keep paying their bills. Don't worry about the herd of animals over here. I mean, it's absolutely despicable. It's absolutely despicable. Um, again, they're, they're saying critical lifeline. Like, what do you mean critical lifeline? You, you mean you're getting critical lifeline so you can sink your hooks into us because we're in need. And that's my concern. People are already desperate. When you give someone that's desperate, that just lost everything, 15, $20,000, they spend that money so fast. It'll make their head spin. But the problem is, is even though they may spend that money in a week, two weeks, that debt will follow them for the rest of their life. And now Mitch, let's move on to the last segment here. This is all you brother. And this is the compound cumulative chart. Uh, let me pull this up for the viewers. And if you can, go ahead and explain this. This is a great chart. It's actually two pages. This will be linked in the description. And Mitch, whenever you're ready, sir. Okay, so I put this together, <laughs> the graphic for a reason. And as you can see, things start off relatively small on the upper side, upper right-hand corner, and then they start expanding. Well, the colors aren't all that relevant other than helping people see what's going on. But what is relevant are the numbers with inside of that circle. And then we took those numbers and put them off to a left or right hand column. And the point is that what you're looking at is compound cumulative real estate tax fraud and how that is in truth ground zero of all the problems that we've been talking about for the last 45 or 50 days. So we've enumerated every single problem that occurs and how they start spinning. When I was mentioning that uh, hurricane effect, well, that's basically what you're looking at here. This is a circle effect and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But the nucleus of the circle all starts with the real estate tax fraud because it can't be paid off. It's proven. You've already got 37 percent. By the way, that's also in the in, in, in the tax portion of this. 37% of your household population is going to go bankrupt and or they're going to lose the roof over their head. Again, that's part of the nucleus of all this. So we don't have to go through all 70 points, but the point is all of that data is here. So if you want to simply look at three pages and say, how does this all work? What are the connections? This is the document. So all the other documents we've tied or presented to you in the past will end up in this one document. It's, it's all mentioned here. You know, the societal differences, uh, socialism, et cetera, et cetera. You can see how it all spins from here. Outstanding. And this is gonna be, again, linked in the description, right? Should we send it a PDF or keep it as a Microsoft Word document? Um, no, the PDF is, is better, but the PDF is live and working and the links in the PDF are live and working. So all the different videos that we've done, it's all here, the links to the videos. You, you can take your time and go through every video if you wish. It's all there. But this is the crux of the problem, be it on the federal level and on the local real estate taxing entity level. Outstanding, Mitch. Absolutely outstanding. So again, you guys spend some time. Mitch worked very hard on that document for you to make you aware because that's step one. You know, Mitch knows, as do I, as should you, that there is strength in numbers, that we can't do this alone. And that's, again, you guys, why I've made that course. Again, just update on that. That should be completed by the time, hopefully by the time this video is out, it is done being recorded. It took me two months. There's something like 45 segments in this sucker. But I made it to make teachers super happy about that. Also, you guys, a quick update. All of the stuff that Mitch and I have been doing over the two months, again, 
we have been working on one single video that should be done this week as well. Really excited. And then also I'm really strongly debating Mitch. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to have to go out to North Carolina, man. I'm going to have to go out to North Carolina and I want to do a couple of things. I, I want to take it in account for all of the houses that got swept away that are right next to the mines. I've uncovered the fact that there are an overwhelming amount of lithium mines or in prospects in North Carolina. I didn't know that. And I just want to make sure that the homeowners that they've been fighting with legitimately been fighting with are not going to get bullied, but I'm worried that there's going to be some type of state mandatory buyout program where they're going to force them out and they're going to give that property to the mine. So I want to cover that. And I also want to go around to three different areas, uh, mountain King and then spruce pine, and then just a little bit North of mountain King as well and start testing some of the water there next to those mines and just really see what's going on there as well as documenting the recovery. Should I go, Mitch? Yeah, as long as you don't make a pain in the out of yourself because you know housing and hotels are booked up from all sorts of problems, right? Because people have to have a place to live. So if you can go during the day and get out at nighttime so you're not putting stress on the infrastructure and everybody else that's there, there are problems. There's no doubt about it. And these are big problems. Let me tell you something, Mitch. Okay. I'm a land-based shark fisherman. All right. You know how often I've sleep on the floor or on the beach on the sand, brother, I'm just going to get out there. I'm going to have yes. my boots. I want to, I want to get out. I want to get up in those mountains. I want to get the drone up there and I want to see what's really going on with the mines and that whole area. I'm going to get dirty. Uh, and I'm going to pull my weight. That's, that's one thing I always try to do, sir, is pull my weight. Now, um, let me know if you guys think I should go comment below. Seriously. Let me know. It's been on my heart. Melody's obviously out there. Mitch, any closing words before we let the viewers go? The graphic that we just presented and that Travis will put below the video is the entire length of the problems. You can step through it. It's only two and a half pages. But when you read it, you will see all these problems, including the fact that the government isn't responding. So they're taking your money, but they're not responding to these disasters. Um, the government through the SBA is now claiming, well, we're out of money. That means that they're not responding to the disasters. It also means that they're incapable of performing their own budget. So all of these things are enumerated in here and it's not designed to annoy people. It's designed to state facts. These are the issues that we are dealing with. The debt load is probably the largest issue we are going to deal with in the upcoming immediate future. These the debts can't be paid back. The mass says it can't be paid back, right? 67% to 72% of the population can't afford what the government, local taxing entity, is stating is a median priced home. Well, if 72% can't afford it and 37% are going to lose the roof over their head, that's clear proof there is no money to pay for these debts. There is no money to pay for the interest. The government's admitted that. They've got one and a half trillion dollars roughly of deficit. That means money they don't have that they've got to go print. You print, you create inflation. And that is what this document is doing. It's literally laying out the nexus between one bullet point and another and another. And that's how you end up in cumulative compounding real estate tax fraud. I'd rather be annoying. In fact, I know I'm annoying and I'm sorry real quick. <laughs> sorry about that. But hey, man, I would rather be annoying than just stand by and let apathy yeah. destroy America. So I'm, I'm going to be annoying. I'm sorry. I'm trying to pull it in, though. I'm trying to calm down. But other than that, you guys, it's Monday. Cut me some slack. I really hope you guys have a great week. And if you're out there just living your life, investing in real estate, you guys already know we wish you luck and we hope you win.